Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I grew up in a city very similar to Alexandria. I grew up in a well, slightly colder city. I grew up in a city, a small town in northern Canada called Sudbury, which was um, a mining town. We produced 95% of the world's nickel. So you guys kind of revolve around the lumber industry. We revolved around the mining industry. Um, this would have felt like a very typical gathering of entrepreneurs in the city I grew up in. Um, I just sent a note to my brother asking him what the weather was like. It's 12 degrees Fahrenheit in Sudbury today, and it's snowing again. And my brother's ready to kill himself. Um, so I, I moved to Phoenix a couple of years ago, and he's you know dying the fact that I can go golfing this weekend again, and he'll be shoveling snow in his driveway for the Easter Bunny. Um, before I dive into the content, I just want to read a list of traits of entrepreneurs. Now, if you're the entrepreneur, um, when you hear five traits that describe you, I'd like you to stand up. And if you're here supporting or working with the entrepreneur, as soon as you hear five traits that describe the entrepreneur, then you can stand up as well. So these are traits of entrepreneurs. As soon as you hear five that describe you, there's only 11 on the list. As soon as you hear five, I'd like you to stand. Are you often filled with energy? Are you often flooded with ideas? Are you driven? Are you restless? Are you unable to keep still? That's five. Are you often working on little sleep? <laughs> Do you get euphoric? Do you burn out periodically? Do you get easily irritated by minor obstacles? Do you act out sexually, which is like flirting? And the last, do you feel persecuted by those who do not accept your vision? Now take a look around the room. You actually all stood up to the list of traits of bipolar disorder. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah, uh-oh, right? Now we all knew we were a little different here, but we didn't know we were all manic depressive. So the reason I bring this up is entrepreneurs are different. Um, did any of you watch any of the talks on TED.com? Any watch TED Talks? So I did a talk that's on, on TED and it was about raising kids to be entrepreneurs instead of lawyers. When I was a child growing up in Sudbury, I always felt like I was persecuted against in the school system. I was told to sit still and pay attention and why am I so filled with energy one day and why am I kind of depressed and sad the next day and why can't I just be like all the other kids and why was I selling stuff to all the kids constantly and why couldn't I just fit in and stop trying to find shortcuts. Well, I didn't fit in. I was wired differently. I was manic half the time. I was sad the next day. And I was completely distracted because it was just way too much stuff to look at. And there was all these opportunities to sell stuff. So why wouldn't I sell stuff? But the teachers wanted me to be like everybody else. So they wanted to medicate me. And the doctors wanted to medicate me because I had a problem. My problem was ADD and I was manic depressive. Thankfully, my parents said, no, he's an entrepreneur, and they refused medication. Um, my talk now talks about the fact that we are different. See, you think that it was funny to stand up to those traits, but manic depression, or bipolar disorder, is nicknamed by the medical community as the CEO disease. Most entrepreneurs are clinically diagnosed as bipolar. Most entrepreneurs have all the signs of attention deficit disorder. So we're not like teachers, we're not like doctors. I've done those lists of traits to 350 accountants and seven people stood up. I do the list to you and half of you stood up when we got to five, okay? We're different. So my content today is geared for us. It's geared for entrepreneurs. We learn differently, we think differently, we act differently. There's not gonna be a lot of theory in this presentation because we hate theory. We just wanna know like, give me the shortcuts. I'm gonna give you the shortcuts on how to grow companies. Before I go into this content, I wanna give you a little bit of background so you know who I am and where I come from. Um, turn this on. I had the name Cameron a long time before she did. <laughs> <laughs> Checking into hotels, they've always got me down now as Ms. Cameron Harold. I'm like, really? Uh, I've got four kids, two little girls and two boys. My wife is also an entrepreneur. We live in Phoenix. We also have a place up in Vancouver, so we're there a lot as well. We love golfing, love to play tennis love skiing, I really like to uh, cook, I love red wine, and I spend a lot of time with my friends, most of whom are entrepreneurs. Um, I get entrepreneurs, it's the group of people that I like to associate with. One of my kids actually saw this slide one day and I said, those are my friends. He goes, really? 
I like this guy. I'm like, no, they're not really my friends. It's just the way I think of them. Um, I'm a bit of a serial entrepreneur as well. I've started a lot of different businesses. By the time I was 19, I'd had about 15 different entrepreneurial ventures. So we were probably like many of you, we were just wired a little bit differently. Where I learned how to run a company was this company here. It was called College Pro Painters. Has anyone here ever heard of College Pro? None of you. So it's interesting. This is actually the largest house painting company in the world. They do $60 million in revenue. They operate in 43 states, nine provinces, and they only have 60 people at the head office. So the 60 people at the head office, every September, they go out and recruit and train 800 franchisees from university campuses. They sign a one-year franchise agreement with all 800 franchisees. Those 800 people then go off and they hire 8,000 house painters, all of whom are students, university or college students. And we train them in the last couple weeks of April. And then from May 1st until August 31st, we do $60 million in revenue, painting residential houses exterior only, because we won't allow kids to go inside because we'll screw it all up. So we stay outside where we can't mess too much up. $60 million in revenue, and then all 8,800 people go back to school, and the 60 people at the head office do it again. And they've been doing it since 1971. So imagine building a 9,000 person company from scratch. I ended up running a franchise for them for three years while I was in university, and then I was on the leadership team. I was in the top 20 people in the company. So every year I was a part of the 20 people building this 9,000 person company. That's where I really learned how to run a business and how to build a company. When I was 21, when I was 21 years old, I had 12 full-time employees. Um, oh, that's kind of weird. Just went to a different slide. That's my wife and daughter. When I was 21, I had 12 full-time employees. Uh, but for me, the number 21 looks like the number 12. I have a form of dyslexia where I flip all of my numbers around. So anytime I write down a string of numbers, it's always wrong, which was frustrating running a business, but it was worse in university because anytime a girl ever gave me her phone number, it was wrong. I just didn't know if she didn't like me or if I'd written it down wrong again. I've got 18, or 17 of the 18 signs of attention deficit disorder. Uh, my wife said if I was paying attention, I would have said yes to the 18th question. She's probably right. So the, you know, the glare off the lights, the guy in the third row clicking his pen, all of this will drive me completely crazy today. Um, I co-founded a group called Boyd Auto Body and Glass, which we built up. It's now about a $600 million publicly traded company on the TSE. It's the largest collision repair chain in North America. Built another company that we sold for 64 million Canadian, which was 42 million US at the time. It was back in October of 2000 when the Canadian dollar was trading at 61.8 cents to the US. And then we sold for stock, so I ended up with what you see on the bottom right hand corner. The 64 million dollar valuation at closing was worth 3.8 million. So we effectively lost the entire thing that we built. So I became a garbage man. Anyone heard of 1 800 Got Junk? So a few more, so that's interesting. So uh, 1-800-GOT-JUNK is the largest junk removal service on the planet now. Um, when I joined, we had 14 employees, and when I left, we had 3,100 employees system-wide. I came on to join my best friend, Brian, who'd started the company. We were in a group called the Entrepreneurs' Organization, or YEO, and we'd been meeting together every month for five years. Brian had seen me building companies and asked me if I would coach him and if I'd work behind the scenes to help him build a company called The Rubbish Boys. So we changed the name over to 1-800-GOT-JUNK, we built the company out, and it became what we know of today, operating in 330 cities, 46 states, nine provinces, four countries. We had 240 people at the head office. We landed 5,200 stories about our company in the press. We ranked as the number two company in all of Canada to work for. We had no debt. We gave up no equity in the company, and we were profitable every year for six years. So the systems that I'm going to teach you today are the ones that we use to build those four companies, and they're also systems that work when you're a small company at 14 people or when you're a much larger company. These systems that I'm going to talk to you about today are used by entrepreneurs all over the world. I've actually given this content in 28 countries now. Um, I've been hired by huge companies like British Aerospace Engineering and by small 10-person companies to put the same systems in place. So these will work in your business. And now what I do is I work behind the scenes and I coach CEOs of growth organizations all over the world. So I work behind the scenes teaching people like you how to actually build profitable companies. There's not a lot of bullet points in this presentation. It's actually been proven that you can't listen and read at the same time, so there's not gonna be a lot of text up on the screen today. Keep your mind open that maybe I'm right. Maybe these ideas from this Canadian kid 
who built a junk removal business or a house painting company, maybe it'll work in your type of business. Right? Maybe it'll work in a manufacturing company or a lumber company or a bar. I went to Spirits last night with Wayne Mullins from Ugly Mug Marketing. Like, I get your businesses. Okay? This stuff will work. So keep your mind open. Try to be the dumb person in the room today that maybe these systems will work for you. You're going to drink out of a fire hose today. It's going to feel like this information is coming at you really quickly. Try not to write everything down. Um, I think a lot of you got a copy of my book, Double Double. Um, if you want other copies of it, you can get it on Amazon. But just try to take notes of maybe the top five or ten things that you want to put in place this year. Don't write eight pages of notes because you'll overwhelm yourself. If you've got uh, the copy of Double Double, I don't want you to read it. What I want you to do is only read five key chapters. I think it's insane that you would read a book without knowing the purpose for actually reading it. The chapters that you should be reading are chapters one, two, three, four, and six. Those are really the core chapters for you to read. If you want a bonus chapter, read this one here, The Roller Coaster Ride of Entrepreneurship, which talks about being bipolar as entrepreneurs and how to leverage each of the stages that you go through of riding that natural roller coaster. But don't read the whole book. If you could all grab your handouts that you've got in front of you and just um, take the last page of your handouts off. That's not for notes. It's actually, if you're interested in teaching this content to your employees, this is a great way to be able to teach them at the end. So just pull that one page aside. Just rip that page off your handouts and put it aside. So these are the numbers of 1-800-GOT-JUNK. You can see what our growth looked like. For six years in a row, we averaged 100% revenue growth. As I said, we did this without giving up a single percentage of equity in the company. We did this with no debt. We actually had no operating credit line. We operated completely off cash flow, which was stupid, but we did it. Um, you can see what our employee count went like, our number of franchisees. This was a real business. This was a really complex business. It had an awful lot of moving parts. And the systems that I'm going to walk you through are the exact systems we learned to do here. First thing I learned when I was 16 years old, my dad pulled me aside. I was starting to run my first real business at about 16. And he said, I want to teach you something. Now, my dad was an entrepreneur. Both my grandfathers were entrepreneurs, aunts and uncles. Like, our whole family was just entrepreneurs. It's all we really knew. My dad pulled me aside, and he said, you'll never be smart enough to figure this out on your own. He said, what I mean by that is your R&D has to stand for rip off and duplicate, not research and development. He said, millions of companies have already spent millions of dollars figuring out the best ways to do something. Instead of you figuring it out, just grab the shortcuts from them. It's the same way I got through high school and university was finding the cheats or finding the shortcuts. Instead of having to memorize the entire darn textbook, the answers are all in the back anyway. Just memorize the answers in the back. I don't have to read the whole textbook. That was crazy town. So he taught me to look for what the best companies were doing and just do what they were doing. So there's not a single system that I'm going to talk to you about today that was my idea. These are the systems that we found that all the best companies were doing, and we dumbed them down in a way that they were very easy to put in place. They didn't require having an MBA, and I actually think a bunch of MBAs start messing up our businesses anyway. Here's the first thing we did. It's called the painted picture. So the painted picture is a concept that we learned about from an Olympic coach. There were about 60 CEOs in Vancouver, Canada that were invited to a lunch one day. We were invited to lunch with this CEO or this Olympic coach, and only 16 of us showed up because we thought going was going to be kind of a waste of time. We didn't understand what this Olympic coach could have to teach us about business. We showed up at the lunch, and he talked about vision. He talked about looking into the crystal ball or going in a time machine out into the future. And about 13 or 14 minutes into the presentation, the 16 of us looked at each other and we went, why are we here? This guy's really, really crazy. It's not going to be applicable at all. But we stayed. And thankfully, we did stay. He was talking about how athletes can see themselves performing the event. And he said, if you can see your business the same way that an athlete can see themselves and feel themselves performing the event, you'll be able to figure out how to make that happen. But he said, most entrepreneurs don't lean out into the future to see what the future looks like. They simply get up every day working hard on what they have today. You know, they go to the email and they try to chase down all the work in front of them instead of leaning out a little bit. So this painted picture was leaning out into the future. We had no idea what he was talking about. 
So he gave us an analogy of Brooke Shields. He said when Brooke Shields was getting married to Andre Agassi, she didn't like her legs. So she put a picture up on the refrigerator of what she wanted her legs to look like on her wedding day. You know, her perfect legs. Well, we know the marriage between Brooke Shields and Andre Agassi didn't work out. Andre ended up getting married to Steffi Graf. The crazy thing was, those were Steffi Graf's legs. <laughs> so, <laughs> the process of visualization did work. Unfortunately, it worked for Andre, not for Steffi. Well, we still didn't understand, how do you bring that into the business world? So we found a business example that worked for us, and it was home construction, home building. Has anybody here ever built a home or done a renovation to their home? It's almost all of you, good. So we know as homeowners, when we're doing a build, we don't necessarily have the technical skills to do it. I can't do electrical and plumbing, and I, I don't understand how to do drywall, and I can't do all the framing and the trim. I just know I want the wolf stove with the red knobs, and I want it in tomorrow, but I know I'm not gonna get it for seven months. So I know how to dream, but I don't know how to execute the dream. Well, construction projects work on understanding the dream. See, the, the general contractor that we hire to do the work, or the renovator, gets inside of our mind to see what we can see. Well, how do they get inside of our mind? What do they do? What do we give them as the homeowner? What do we give them? Pictures, before the plans, maybe sketches, maybe some, some um, pages out of magazines that we like, maybe photos from home shows or flyers, and we say, build me this. And then the, the contractor takes all of our pictures and sketches and drawings, and what does he do with them? He goes away and comes back with what? He comes back with the blueprints. He takes your vision, and he draws a plan to make your vision happen. And once you sign off on the blueprints and the elevation drawing and the engineering drawings, what do they do with those drawings then? They give them to the workers, and the workers recreate the vision that you have in your mind. So the workers don't necessarily have to talk to you because they have something that they can read that shows them what your vision is. This started to make a little bit of sense to us. So about eight years ago, I was doing a huge renovation to a house in Vancouver. We were taking an old heritage home and renovating it. And I had this sketch on day one of a, not a sketch, sorry, a picture out of a magazine of a fireplace. And I handed it to the contractor, Daryl. I'm like, this is what I want it to look like. He's like, yeah, I get it. I'm like, no, no, Daryl. He goes, Cameron, I get it. You want exactly what's in the picture. I'm like, yeah. He goes, okay, I got it. About four months later, I walked in the front door and I stopped. And in front of me, at the other end of the living room, was this fireplace. And it was exactly as I could remember in that picture. <laughs> And there was a worker sitting on the floor by the fireplace, and I walked up to it, and he looked up at me, and he said, do you like it? I'm like, yeah. He goes, is it what you remember? I said, yeah. And he points to a picture on the wall, and he goes, there's your picture. Daryl had taken the picture that I gave him on day one, had it with the plans, and when the worker was getting ready to build it, he put it on the wall beside the fireplace with the elevation drawings and plans to make my picture come true. The worker never talked to me. He didn't need to talk to me because he could see what was in my head. That concept made sense. So how do we as entrepreneurs take the vision that we have in our head, how do we get it out of our head and give it to the employees? Well, basically, as entrepreneurs, we've got a bit of a movie playing in our mind. Who's seen the movie The Sound of Music? Put your hand up. Okay, who has never seen the movie The Sound of Music? Who has no idea what the movie The Sound of Music is about? Okay, no idea. Now, don't, don't say anything, don't say anything. What's your name? Mark. Mark, and you have no idea what it's about, right? What the hell do you do with your free time, dude? It's a good movie. <laughs> Well-dressed guy, like my favorite movie of all time. Okay, can we get him out of here, please? Okay, so you have no idea, right? Okay, now don't give Mark any hints. So there's a really famous scene in the movie. Don't say anything. There's a really famous scene in the movie where they're having a picnic, okay? Now, who knows the movie really well? Okay, now don't say anything. If I asked you to recreate the picnic scene, could you do it? Yes or no? Yeah, pretty good, right? Now, Mark, you're a smart guy, right? Well-dressed, like super, right? Yeah, so I'm gonna delegate. You're my VP of operations. I'm gonna give you a big project. We're having this company picnic, but I want you to have the picnic set up just like the sound of music, okay? You could do a pretty good job of it. You're my smart guy, though, right? Well-dressed, everything. So I'll give you a couple of hints. Is the picnic... Uh, at a park, in the mountains, or at a lake? At a 
at a lake. Okay, good. So we're going to have a picnic at a lake, right? And where do we buy or where do we get the food, Mark? Do we get it at a grocery store or in a picnic basket or a little hut that we buy it at? Picnic basket. Okay, so we're having a picnic at a lake, food in the picnic basket, and there's going to be kids at our picnic. Are the kids dancing or playing baseball or playing croquet? Playing. What was the first? Dancing, baseball, or croquet? Baseball. Baseball. Okay, so we're having the picnic at a lake, the food's in a picnic basket, and the kids are playing baseball. Mark, what are you, an idiot? It's the sound of music, Mark. There's a hint, a really big one. The sound of baseball? No, this isn't the Field of Dreams, Mark. This is Julie Andrews in the Swiss Alps. There's no lake, right? You knew this, right? Austrian Alps. Austrian Alps, okay. Like, can you imagine the idiot who would have these kids playing baseball? <laughs> Hello? No, you're a good guy. Right, ADD, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you probably got your MBA too, right? <laughs> see, here's the problem. As entrepreneurs, we see something we delegate people to, to people, and they do their best at creating what they think we see. So if I don't share the movie with Mark and say, create this scene, how could he possibly create this scene if he can't see what I see? So I go away on vacation for two weeks, and I come back, and I go, how did you screw this thing up? It was so simple. He didn't screw it up. See, there's not a single one of your employees that shows up at work wanting to mess something up. They show up at work every day wanting to do their best, but they only see what they can see unless you show them what you can see. If you don't show them what you can see, they can't recreate it. Now, Mark, if I said create a picnic like this, could you do it? Would you have it at a lake? No. Would you have the food in a picnic basket? Yeah. And would you have the kids playing baseball or maybe singing and dancing? Right? Like, they're not even dancing here, but you know they're probably going to at some point because she doesn't have her baseball glove out. So the concept of the painted picture is something that you're going to learn on how to put together. It ties in this idea of conceive, believe, and achieve. Our role as the entrepreneur is to conceive. Our role is to come up with the idea of what the business looks like. A painted picture is a written document that's about three or four pages long maximum and describes in vivid detail what your company looks like three years from today. You literally go in a time machine to December 31st, 2016, and you describe every aspect of your business. You describe what your customers are saying. You describe, excuse me, what the media is saying. You describe what your suppliers are saying. You describe how 25% of your new business is coming from outside of Alexandria because you're selling into other markets. You describe what operations is like and what sales is like. You describe what your learning is like. You describe every aspect of your business as if it's come true. That's your pictures that you hang up beside the fireplace. Now once you as the entrepreneur have a clear vision and it's in writing as to what it looks like, then you give it to your employees and you say, figure out how to make this happen. Let's put the plans in place to make this happen. But you're at least getting your vision to trickle down to your employees. See, our vision is in our mind. We need to get it out in a way that they can see and feel it. So in your handouts, you've actually got a copy of a painted picture. If you give me a business card and put a P on it, I'll send you three copies of other companies' painted pictures that'll give you some other examples as to what a business painted picture is going to look and feel like. When you're writing your painted picture, you've got to get out of the box. You can't sit in your company, in your office, and write this. You've got to go somewhere where you're inspired. Go sit somewhere at a lake or at a park. Go sit somewhere where you can relax. No laptop, no iPad. Take a notepad, turn it sideways in landscape mode, and just write down some ideas of what your company looks like. Do a mind map and describe all the different aspects and different areas of your business. In your handouts, I actually gave you um, a worksheet that you can actually write some ideas of what your business starts to look and feel like. But don't do it at your office, because that's where you get stuck in you know, how mode or planning mode. Go sit somewhere, like in a park. Once you actually write up all your rough notes, you can just put them in bullet points and just start organizing them by business area on those handouts that I gave you. Don't worry about it being perfect. 
Just get it written up in rough. Once it's in rough, then you can kind of write it up into paragraph form so that these three or four pages start taking shape, much like the example I gave you or the examples I'll email you if you send me um, or give me your business card. Once you've got your rough version written up, then you can get a writer to really polish it and make it jump off the page. You can get some graphic design elements added to it to make it a little bit more visceral, a little bit more exciting than just kind of the plain written text that's kind of boring. I had a client in Boston that ran a chain of bilingual preschools, so they used little crayon sketches for each of the sections of their painted picture to make it more visceral and make it jump off the page. Now imagine if you were to read something like this, describing your company three years in the future, how every employee can see and feel what you can see. In 2000 and, uh, 2009, I was teaching at a program that's held at MIT every year called the Entrepreneurial Master's Program. It's a group of 65 CEOs from around the world that are selected to go to this program. They go for four days, and then 12 months later for another four days, and 12 months later for the next four days. So it's a short little program. But it's 65 CEOs from around the world. One of them came in, he was a 35-year-old from uh, Geneva, Switzerland. His name is Sebastian Tondur. Sebastian's company was doing 120 million in revenue. Sorry, 106 million in revenue. And Sebastian learned about this concept of the painted picture and saw the rest of my content that you'll see today. And he sent me his painted picture a couple of years later, or sorry, a couple of weeks later, describing his company at 2015. So he leaned out three years sorry, describing in 2012, and leaned out and described his company in 2012, saying that his company would be doing 500 million in revenue from 106 to 500 million in three years. And he described what the company would look and feel like. I worked behind the scenes coaching Sebastian on it for the next three years. He ended up doing 506 million in revenue from 106 three years earlier. And his profit number was 120 million three years later. He went from 106 million in revenue to 120 million in profit. Sebastian rolled out his 2015 painted picture in 2012, describing what the company would look like at a billion dollars in revenue and operating in these 14 countries with 2,100 employees around the world. Sebastian runs the largest meeting planning company and event planning company in the world. Sorry, second largest in the world. Um, I'm going to give, show you a little video of what he used recently to roll out his 2015 painted picture to all of his employees system-wide. So this video went out to introduce the 2015 painted picture to a group of people that had already seen and been living the 2012 for three years.
So that video introduction ends with a link. When his employees clicked on the link, they could open up the painted picture in one of the eight languages, because he had it rewritten for them, so that no matter what country they worked in, they could actually read the CEO's vision in the language that they learned best in. That video only had 140 words in it. It was a four-page painted picture compressed down to 140 words. But imagine how clear they are, are now on where he's taking the company and what the company needs to look like versus how clear your employees are on what you want to build. See, for most of us, we just want our employees to read our minds. They can't read our minds. Most of us sit around thinking that we're really, really, really intuitive. We're no more intuitive than our employees. We're just the only ones who can see the movie. See, the problem isn't that business is hard. Business isn't hard. We make it really hard on ourselves by not at least sharing the vision or the movie with all of our employees. That's why you need to write a painted picture. In business school, they screw us all up. They tell you all to do a mission statement. You know, get all of your employees together, pick all your favorite words, put them up on a whiteboard. Let's vote on which words we like best, right? Sound familiar? Let's eliminate all the words that didn't get any votes. Let's take those six or seven words that are left, let's mash them together in a big sentence, and that's our mission statement. Go team. That doesn't align people. There's still way too much out there for interpretation. When you're writing a painted picture, it has to be like a magnet. It has to attract people to your vision. They have to really, really get it and be excited by what they read. Now, if a, if a magnet attracts, what else does a magnet do? <coughs> it repels. So your painted picture has to repel people as well. It has to push some people away. Your painted picture, your vision of what your company looks like is not meant to be perfect for everybody, right? It's kind of like if, you ha if you're gonna have a restaurant and a bar, do you really want one that is appealing to everybody? No, because then no one's really appealed to it at all. Right? It has to just feel right to that group of people you're trying to attract, and it has to push a few other people away. One of my favorite stories about really pushing people away was during the Salt Lake City Olympics. There was a, a beer company, um, and they had a, uh, a beer called Polygamy Porter. So Polygamy Porter, their advertising said, you know, bring some home to the wives or you can't have just one. I mean, pretty racy stuff, right? Well, CNN was interviewing the CEO of Polygamy Porter, and he said, you know, you're, you're really upsetting all the Mormons. And he goes, yeah, but Mormons don't drink beer. <laughs> so I'm not saying that you have to be that edgy, but what they understood was Mormons don't drink beer, so if we're a beer company, I don't really care if I'm upsetting the Mormons because they're not my target market. Your painted picture has to be written in such a way that it completely aligns people with your organization. It's exactly what Steve Jobs did with the Macintosh group 30 years ago because he created this, or wanted to create this insanely great product that would challenge the status quo. Remember when the Mac came out, its operating system was on a floppy drive. That was insane. He didn't care that it was insane because if you didn't like it, he didn't want you as a customer. His product was twice the cost of every other computer. He didn't care. He wanted to create something that was so different. And the people who aligned behind him with that got it. And he didn't care about the rest. It's why the iPhone still has no keypad. And look at us all using them. Right? Who here uses a Blackberry? Blackberries are like disco. Right? <laughs> I mean, disco used to be cool too, right? You don't still do disco, do you? Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> Mark picked the pick on me seat today. Um, when you roll out a painted picture in your company, it's going to feel a little bit stupid. I'm going to show you a video of what it feels like to roll out a concept like a painted picture. There's a person dancing. I want you to think of this person as you, because you've now created a painted picture and you're rolling it out to your whole company. So this is you, the CEO. You've got an idea and you're going to talk about it until people fall in line. See, this guy wants people to dance. The problem is nobody's dancing. But he's going to dance because he wants people to dance with him. You're going to keep talking about your painted picture until people fall in line, but nobody really joins until a salesperson starts first. Usually a salesperson will join in around the concept of vision. And they'll dance with you for a while. But look at some of the people sitting close to you. Your VPs of IT, your suppliers, your spouse, they think you're crazy because you're talking about the future and all they can see is today. But you keep dancing. 
they're going to keep staring at you going, dude, you don't get it. Like, that's not what the company looks like. But you keep talking about the company three years out as if it exists, and people will start to fall in line with you. Sales guy is going to keep dancing. Marketing guy joins you. Sales guy leaves. Keep dancing. You have to be so convinced that your painted picture is correct that people will start to come around you. You keep communicating the future, keep communicating the future. Sales guy comes back in. A couple operations people join in. A couple of IT people join in. This is when you start to realize that you're onto something. But look at the people sitting close to you that think you're crazy, that are never gonna stand up. They have no desire to join you. These are the people you have to get out of your company. We are not a charity. We are not the government. We own the company. We're allowed to get rid of the cultural cancers that work with us. But this is what starts to happen when you're creating a really great company with vision is people want to work with you now. This is what it felt like the first time we ranked number one to work for in British Columbia. The following year we ranked number one to work for again. We were getting 250 resumes for every job posting. Well, there were people who did not want to work for 1-800-GOT-JUNK. That's okay. We didn't want you working with us either. We had other people who we ranked number two to work for in all of Canada picketing outside of our offices wearing sandwich boards saying, please bring me in for an interview. We had people in job interviews saying, I don't even care what role you hire me for, just let me work here. We had people coming in for less money than they were making in prior jobs just to be a part of the culture. But look around you, and there's still people sitting right close to you that never actually stand up. This video was on. 45,000 people ended up dancing because one person was going to dance until everybody danced. You have to have the courage of conviction to say, I know this vision is right. I don't care if you don't believe me. Whoever believes me, let's build this and then one by one attract people in who buy into that vision, and one by one get people out who don't. And yes, I know we're in a small town. And yes, I know Alexandria is different. No, it's not, by the way. My area is different, my business is different. Well, you don't understand. I've heard it, I've been in 28 countries. It's all the same. The difference is, I had somebody one time in the city of Calgary say, well, you don't understand, it's just impossible to get good employees to work here. No, it's impossible to get good employees to work for an average company. But when you create a culture that is so strong that when people walk in the front door, they go, oh my gosh, I want to be a part of this. And when they read your painted picture or when the media is talking about your painted picture, they actually are vibrating and they're excited, they will want to work for you. And the more of those people you get into your company, the more you'll push out the people who don't fit. Do you ever notice that when you go to a Starbucks or a coffee shop in the morning and you get served by somebody who's really happy and friendly, what does that do to your day? It sends you off in a pretty good way, right? Now, have you ever had someone who's like really grumpy serve you in the morning? What does that do to you? It kind of pisses you off and it throws you off on the wrong way. It's why if you stub your toe in the morning, why does it ruin your whole morning? You have to think about your company the same way. There's principles of quantum mechanics, quantum science, science at the molecular level. Okay, has anybody ever heard any read anything about quantum physics or quantum science? Let me explain something at a very basic level. You know the law of gravity, right? Like if you drop something, it falls to the ground at 9.83 meters per second. That's the law of gravity. It's irrefutable, it's been measured, it's proven, it actually exists on the entire planet, it's the same. So whether you believe it or not, it's true, like you can't argue this, okay? Physics, there's science laws. So some of the laws are around magnetism. Like attracts like, right? The laws of, of magnetism with repelling. Well, energy at our molecular level, so at our molecules, our skin, whether we got here from Adam and Eve or whether we got here because we grew out of monkeys or whatever, at our molecular level, irrefutable in science, we are protons and neutrons bouncing around. Okay? We are energy. Well, if we are energy, then we act like energy. If you're around positive energy, it creates more positive energy. If you're around negative energy, it creates negative energy. It's like a speaker standing up in front of you who talks like this and reads off of a piece of paper. We all want to kill ourselves, right? But if you have a bunch of good energy, what does it do? It throws us off in a good way. Your company 
is energy. Your company, at the irrefutable scientific level, is people with molecules bouncing around. If Bob shows up every day and Bob is negative and grumpy and smoking, guess what? He throws off negative bad energy. I coach a client in Florida and one of their interview questions, do you smoke a lot, rarely, or not at all? They actually have figured out a legal way to ask a question. If you answer that you smoke, you do not get hired. They don't want you working there because they realize that you're not healthy and they don't want healthy, unhealthy people. All the people at the 230 people that work at Bobby's company are athletes, triathletes, marathoners. They don't watch reality TV. They have no time for that. They're doing so many other things. That good energy creates more good energy. He's ranked as one of the top companies to work for in Florida. Duh, right? So think about your company this way as energy. Now vision without execution is hallucination. If you're gonna put this painted picture out there, but you're not gonna build off of it, nothing happens. So before I teach you how to make it happen, any questions around the concept of the painted picture? How to write it or why to write it or how does it work or any questions on it? Anybody want to know why it's three years? How do we put it in place? You all get it? Yes. Why is it three years? So the Olympic coach actually taught us this. He said if you lean too far out, five years, it's too far for people to wrap their head around. It's too esoteric. It's too out there. They want something a little bit closer that feels more real. But if it's only one year out, it's too similar to today. It doesn't inspire anybody because it looks too close to what we have. So it's got to be far enough out that it feels a little crazy, but not too far out that you fall over. So three years just tended to be that perfect time frame. By the way, if you want to double your company's revenue and profit in three years or less, all you need is 26% growth, 26% growth, 26% growth, that's double. Three years of 26% compounding is double. There is a bit of a method to this madness here. Other questions? By the way, 26% growth is not fast. If you're not growing at, at like at least that, you're kind of boring. Like why would you go to work and be happy with 7% growth? Kids grow faster than that for God's sakes. We sold our company, <laughs> anyway. What else, any other questions on painted picture before I jump into people? I've done 15 questions on the painted picture concept alone. You got me here once. Okay, we'll ask them at the end. 